So I'm going to give a, a general introduction to software architecture. I'll talk a little bit about how software architecture came into being as a, as a field of study. I'll talk uh, a little bit about software architecture from a research perspective and focus mostly on, on, the, application, uh, on the application side, so how software architecture is practiced in industry today. So it's the case that, that over the last maybe 40 years, uh, software, software systems have grown and they, they started out by having some very specific domain-specific problems. So perhaps you were a physicist or, or a scientist that needed to use computing power in order to help you perform your field of study. And so you would write very small applications in order to, in order to support your needs. Or maybe you were a business that had that had some very specific needs that were, that were uh, um, uh, where you would use automation and computing power. So perhaps you had a payroll system or some other very specific need that would, that would make sense to automate. You would write a program to support those needs. These tended to be very small localized programs that people could write individually for a very specific problem. Uh, kind of think about maybe the construction field and, and when, you, when you would start out building structures, they were very small structures that would support a single family. They weren't that complicated. It was fairly easy for an individual or a small collection of people to think about the materials they would need, to think about the construction process, to think about uh, and, and experiment with the kinds of, of structures that they would need in order to support the load that they would have. If they lived in a cold climate, they would learn that, that maybe you needed to have a roof that was pitched in order to allow for the snow to, to fall off. Uh, they, would, they would learn not to have flat roofs because it would need to bear the weight of the snow. They would think about how, how to build a supporting structure and so forth. But as the discipline emerged or, or progressed, computer systems got larger and larger. And just like physical structures, as buildings got larger and larger, you started to see the, the old techniques break down. And people needed to come up with a new way to, uh, to be able to predict what sort of load a given structure would support. And the same kind of thing started to happen in software. So as companies began to invest more and more in developing software and organizations in general uh, invested more and more in developing software and would rely on software more and more, uh, um, the, the old techniques started to break down. And it started to be the case that, that perhaps you would need to support a large number of concurrent users. Perhaps you would need systems that would be available around the clock. Perhaps you would need to change your systems over time to support a range of needs that, that you could anticipate. Uh, and, and you have no way to begin to predict before you build the system what kinds of properties you might end up with from that perspective. Uh, this is where the, the, uh, the discipline or the field of software architecture sort of came from. Over time, people began to uh, observe that, that certain sorts of, of common solutions would solve particular problems. So very much like, like in the construction industry, people began to to realize that if you're going to build a bridge, there were some number of common patterns that you would apply in order to get the same kind of result. So maybe you would support the bridge from underneath by using an arch, and the arch would have particular properties. So the deck would be fairly rigid. You, uh, um, uh, you could support a, a fairly significant amount of weight given the, the dimensions of the supporting structure and so forth. Or you could have a suspension bridge, which would support the the bridge from above, and in those, in those cases, you would have a very flexible deck that wouldn't be so rigid. You could have longer, unsupported spaces uh, below the bridge and so forth. People began to recognize sim similar things in software. There were certain kinds of styles or patterns that, that would result in similar properties uh, in, in a very general sense. So these are things like maybe a pipe and filter system. Uh, maybe you would have a client server system that could support a larger number of users with, uh, um, uh, with a single server as opposed to, to uh, um, a mainframe system that had all of the computing power centralized and so forth. And, and over time, people began to study these kinds of structures more and began to try to understand specifically what properties were supported and what properties were inhibited by these kinds of structures. And so, and so over time, people began to recognize 
that the architectural decisions that you make, the large structural decisions that you make, are not going to promote or inhibit the kind of functionality that you can realize. Instead, they're going to promote or inhibit the kinds of systemic properties that you might want to have. So much like a building has properties like uh, the impact of vibration, the impact of wind shear, the kind of load that they can support and so forth, software structures have properties as well. So things like availability, things like scalability, things like performance, how long it takes for the system to respond to a request. Um, and, and you need to pay attention to these growth structures in order to, in order to be able to predict what kinds of properties you have. So the holy grail in this, in this discipline is very much like other engineering disciplines where you have a set of structures, you have some known properties that will be promoted and inhibited given these structures, and you're able to analyze those structures before you build the, the system. And so that's the kind of thing that, that people are trying to, to, uh, to focus on and be able to predict uh, in, in academia and research activities. So they're trying to be able to understand more about the structures. They're trying to understand more about the techniques that you would use in order to predict the kinds of properties that you would see. They're trying to compile sort of an engineering handbook that would allow you to say, if I'm going to apply these structures, if I'm going to apply them in the following way, then I could, I could expect the following kinds of results. And so we are, we are somewhere in that continuum in terms of, of understanding those kinds of structures. So we understand them in a fairly general sense. The thing that we need to work on more is understanding how to introduce these concepts into practice. So uh, industry has been a little bit late in, in explicitly realizing that these are the, these are the things that we need to do. Uh, industry has a hard time understanding a given strategic objective, a given business context, and translating that into a set of, of requirements or drivers for software so that people can make these structural decisions up front so that people can do a better job, excuse me, of predicting what sort of properties they're going to, uh, are going to result if you build that given design. And, uh, uh, and this, this is needed in order to allow organizations to make informed decisions. So when you go to build a house, you start out with an awful lot of wishes and a lot of desires. Once you start to have an architect draft the design, then you're going to need to make trade-offs. You're going to need to um, uh, remove some of the things that you'd like because, because the budget won't accommodate it or because you need to have structural supports that are going to interfere with your open concept or, or something along those lines. You need to be able to do that in software in order for organizations to be able to, to make optimal use of of, uh, um, of the, the systems that they, that they build and be able to ensure that they're aligned with their objectives. So what we need really is to, is to have uh, educational systems and techniques that will allow the software engineers of the future to understand these concepts, to be able to put these concepts in practice. We do see some examples of of these kinds of curricula uh, ending up in, in, some, um, in some programs, but it's still uh, fairly, fairly uh, um, sparse. So most programs tend to focus more on core computer science techniques that will allow you to kind of build software in the small, but not on the kinds of techniques that allow those approaches to scale and understand the implications of building systems in, in the large and ensuring that systemic properties are going to, uh, are going to be realized. And so these are, are uh, a variety of techniques that, that have been worked on for some period of time, at least at, at Carnegie Mellon and now at other places, uh, and are, as I've said, are beginning to see, uh, to beginning to gain some traction in industry and in, uh, and in academia, but, uh, but are taking a little bit of time.